We are live. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the three minute thesis uh, competition in the master's division. I'm very excited to be here to co moderate the session. My name is Sylvia Blemker. I'm a uh, a faculty in biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia, and I'm joined by. Hi, and I'm Katie Knaus, and I'm a postdoc at the University of California in San Diego. Excellent. So um, uh, it's an exciting uh, set of uh, short talks that we're going to hear. So each of our um, uh, on our lineup you see here on the, the shared screen has three minutes to give an overview of their thesis of their master's thesis in a high level, exciting way. And so we're gonna give each very, three minutes, it's very strict. And then there's gonna be two minutes of pause in between. We aren't taking questions. That two minutes is for the judges who are in the room to uh, do their scoring and notes. Um, Cause there's gonna ultimately be a winner based on the judging of the competition. I will also note that there's gonna be a people's choice award based on a poll that we will um, put out at the end of the Zoom session. So please hang around the whole time, listen to all of them, pick your favorite, uh, because there is that People's Choice Award and we hope that everyone yeah, um, hey, Can we mute everybody? Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Um, okay, so without further ado, we're gonna start with um, Gabriela Small from the University of Texas at Austin. How often does this happen to you? You're walking down the street and you're looking at your phone. All of a sudden your foot hits the curb and you trip. So we wanted to know, does the fact that you're looking at your phone, that you're thinking about something else affect how you recover from a trip? We previously found that if you are walking and doing a really challenging mental task, you're gonna be more off balance. So if you're walking and trying to do calculus in your head, you're gonna sway side to side more than if you're just walking normally. We also know that foot placement is crucial to maintaining balance while walking. So the purpose of our study was to determine, well, what happens if you change someone's foot placement or cause them to trip or stumble while they are doing a challenging cognitive task? Will the additional distraction cause you to change or delay your reaction that could lead to a fall? To answer this question, we had healthy adults walk while performing cognitive tasks that ranged from listening to a podcast to spelling words backwards. And then a custom made device would unexpectedly change their foot placement or trip them. Essentially, as you're walking, right before your foot hits the ground, it's going to move and land somewhere you did not expect it to. We then analyzed what happened inside of the ankle and the hip to determine how your joints helped you recover. We found that the additional cognitive task did not affect how you recovered. However, we did find that one's ability to perform the cognitive task accurately and quickly decreased during the stumbles that we caused. This suggests that people focused more on their balance than on their cognitive task. Now, at first glance, this might feel a little intuitive, right? Because I care more about not falling on my face than did I spell this word correctly. However, it's really interesting when you put it into context with our previous study that found that during normal walking, people focus more on the cognitive task and less on their walking and balance. But the second there's a threat to their balance, in this case, the stumble that we caused, people immediately switch their prioritization to focus more on restoring their balance and less on their cognitive performance. In conclusion, this research provides the foundation for future studies in neurologically impaired populations. Since it's still unclear how they would prioritize their cognition versus their balance? And are they at risk of falls for how they prioritize these things? And that is especially important as the current generations age with our constant distractions and technology pulling at our attention while we walk. Thank you. Great job, Gabriela. Um, so we have our two minute pause now. 
while we let the judges do their tabulating. So while we won't um, have questions now, feel free to put questions to the speakers in the chat. And then if we have time at the end, we can go back and maybe answer some of those. But in the meantime, we'll entertain you all and let our speakers take a little break because it's hard work to put that much into three minutes. I've done it before. Um, so while we give our judges a little more time here, uh, we thought it'd be fun to fill this time with some biomechanics trivia. Maybe some of you all attended yesterday's student event. Um, so I have a trivia question of kind of inspired by the ergonomic section of our society here. But if anyone knows the original need for a adjustable chair. So in what profession were adjustable chairs first used? You're welcome to put your answers in the chat. Think about that um, while we give a little more time here to our judges. We have a we have a offering from Keith Gordon. Gordon? Barber shop. I go. We'll give ten more seconds, and we'll announce anyone who wants to dispute or agree. They do adjust the barber shop chairs. Yeah. All right. So we're getting ready to move to our next one. So yes, Keith, you are correct. Um, before we all had adjustable office chairs, the actual first ones that could lean, recline, spin, were all in barber shops. Yeah. But now we were in person. I would. If we were in person, I would throw a starburst. <laughs> I know we could have had treats. Yeah. <laughs> All or right. Smart, a smart smarties. That would have been better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So our next speaker is going to be Lauren Grohaski from Vanderbilt University. Take it away, Lauren. Imagine training day after day for a big marathon or race, feet hitting the pavement over and over, feeling yourself getting stronger, when all of a sudden your shins start to hurt. Maybe you keep running and training, but eventually you have to stop and that dream of the race disappears as the stress fractures form. Stress fractures in the tibia bone affect as many as 15% of runners. So what if we could find a way to save that dream and prevent these stress fractures? Well. That's where wearable sensors come into play. If we could find a way to use wearable sensors to measure tibia bone loading, we can potentially measure load over time and alert athletes and runners to stop or reduce training before the stress fractures occur. But to produce a successful wearable system for runners to wear, it has to be as non-disruptive as possible. Therefore, we're looking for a solution that uses a small number of sensors. Through my research, we've decided to use a force sensing insole and an inertial measurement unit, a small sensor that can be placed under the tongue of the shoe. In order, in order to increase accuracy, I look to maximize the capabilities of an insole. In general, insoles are pretty variable sensors due to differences in running, runners' patterns, arches, or even the incline of running. So to minimize these variabilities, I split the insole into three regions, fore, mid, and heel. Each of these regions then produce their own values that can be used to determine to be a bone force. What I found is that using these two sensors and the segmentation technique is that we could produce very accurate estimations of tibia force. Well, you might ask, how could these two sensors produce such accurate estimations of tibia force? The answer may lie in the four section of the foot. Let's think about a typical human stride. Your heel will hit the ground first and then roll forward to push off on your toes. Now let's say you start running on your toes. The ball of your foot will hit the ground and then push forward to push on, off on your toes. So what do these two strides have in common? That front part of your foot or the forward section exports force. No matter how you choose to run, there will be force exported in the, in the forward section of your foot because in order to get to the next step, you have to push off on your toes. Because there's always force exported in this forward section of the foot, it becomes a more reliable metric to use when estimating tibial force. Well, what does this mean for runners? 
It means that we can help prevent those pesky stress fractures from occurring by providing you with a system that can accurately measure your tibia bone force. Now you can run, walk, hike, and train without having to worry about stress fractures slowing you down. Thank you, Lauren. We'll take yeah. our two minute break for the judges. What's our next question, Kitty? All right, we'll do another trivia question. Uh, this one's gonna be Olympics inspired since you know we're just coming off of all of that fun. So the question is, what is the name of the high jump technique that's biomechanically proven to be most effective for clearing the bar? So track and field enthusiasts. Who knows the name of the high jump technique? Mm. Maybe watch some of these in the Olympics, or maybe you've just perused a recent biomechanics textbook. I think it's a favorite example that comes up in a few of them. Oh, okay, we've got, got some answers coming in. Wow. Knew it was named after somebody. Yeah, it's named after the original one. Well, yep, so we've got something, yeah, but see off. You're right, it was the Fosbury flop. So this is that move where the high jumper goes backwards up and over the bar, but by kind of curving themselves around it, effectively keep their center of mass below the bar during the jump, making it possible for them to clear higher bars. So. Thank you all. Good job. Yeah. Got a few more Smarties to throw into the room. <laughs> Virtual Smarties. Virtual Smarties. All right. So we'll give our judges a few more seconds, but we can set up our next speaker. Ready to go? Okay. All right. Our next speaker is Grant Baker from the University of Michigan, Dearborn. Even though women's lacrosse is a non-contact sport, studies show that 40% of both high school and collegiate players suffer at least one concussion during their four years of competition. To address this concern for player safety, a standard was created for optional headgear. Because of how new and unique these headgears are, there's still much to learn about the impact mitigation and concussion reduction abilities of them. The studies that have been done on them have only looked at low impact speeds and have failed to consider any rotational-based kinematic concussion metrics, even though they've been proven to be up to five times as accurate as linear-based metrics. The goal of this research is to address these shortcomings by testing higher impact speeds and using both linear and rotational-based concussion metrics. So for the study, uh, we used a pneumatic linear impactor to impact the hybrid three head form at five meters per second, since this is the average running speed of a women's across player. Um, and I want to note that this is over twice as high as the highest impact speed used in previous studies. These impacts were done at a frontal, front boss and side impact location on the head, headgear, or on the head form, sorry, with no headgear, with the, and then with the two commercially available headgear, the Cascade LX and the Hummingbird V2 shown in the bottom right. Linear acceleration data was then used to calculate the top row of concussion metrics, peak linear acceleration and head injury criteria, or HIC, and then rotational velocity data was used to calculate the bottom row of concussion metrics, peak rotational velocity and brain injury criteria. So the average results from the impact and testing are shown below. And the main finding from these results is that compared to the no headgear impacts, both headgear were able to significantly reduce all four of the concussion metrics at all three impact locations, besides the Cascade LX at the frontal location uh, for the two rotational metrics on the right. However, I wanted to point out that um, on the left side for the two linear metrics, these reductions were about 50% or greater, um, whereas on the right side for the rotational metrics, uh, these reductions were much more subtle. And then also the concussion th thresholds at the bottom indicate that both headgear protect from concussion according to HIC, uh, but they're, some of, they're above the threshold for some of the impact locations for BRIC. So these results should leave you with two key takeaways. 
The first is that concussion metrics used can play a huge role in the determination of how well a helmet uh, is capable of mitigating impact. So it's important to consider both linear and rotational metrics whenever possible. Uh, the second is that even with the current headgear, concussion is still possible at higher impact speeds and moments across. And then lastly, since the headgear is optional, a future direction for research should be to focus on impacts for, on players not wearing the headgear that are hit by a player wearing the headgear. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. Great job for describing your impactful work. Uh -huh, sorry. Um, great job. Thank you. Okay, we're going to give the, the judges a little time to uh, judge while Katie gives us another question. All right, another tricky question. Uh, do some from our animal category. So I like this one where. So dogs wear collars and chew on bones, but lack a fully developed collarbone. What advantage does this give them? Or what spatial temporal parameter does this give a dogs an advantage in? So it's a spatial temporal parameter commonly measured by humans or commonly measured in humans and by humans um, that a dog has an advantage in because it lacks a fully developed collarbone. Mm, see a good ah. idea there. Step length by Kate. So it's a mix of how well you know your gait parameters and dog anatomy. Shoulder anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> I like this answer of pulling kids over while they're walking a big dog. I think big dogs have that advantage, but I'm not sure if that is collarbone related or right. not. <laughs> I think even with a clavicle, a big dog may have an advantage over a small child. Well, my dog has an advantage over me. <laughs> she's not that big. Yeah, I mean. she, she's strong. <laughs> yeah. She's quite a puller. All right. So we're about to move on to our next speaker. So yes, Kate, you were right. Step for stride length is increased. The dog can take a longer step without Comical with their front leg. <laughs> Virtual Skittles, Kate. Yes. <laughs> Go get yourself a bag of Skittles. <laughs> so, our next speaker is Gaspar Diotalevi from the, the University of Shelburne. Oh. Let's consider a tragic situation. A pedestrian is leaning on the bus stop sign, but as his head raises to watch the bus come in his way, his shoulder slips and he starts falling sideways, prompting the driver to do an emergency brake. The unsuspecting passenger at the back of the bus feels the ground shifting from under the feet and starts falling towards the windshield. What the pedestrian experienced is called a lean release because he fell from an angle without any energy being transmitted to him. The passenger felt a surface translation, as if someone had pulled a rod from under her feet. My job is to model the first hundreds of milliseconds after a loss of balance due to such perturbations or their combination, up to the point when your main concern becomes taking a step to avoid a fall. To do so, I replace people with an inverted pendulum on a skid in my computer program and make it fall forward sideways or backwards. Comparing the experimental trials made by my predecessor with results from my model, I have proven that it can accurately predict how far and how fast a young, a young adult have fallen up to the end of reaction time. But why do I only study what happens up to reaction time and not the whole fall, you may ask? Well, my lab's prior research has shown that you can predict the outcome of a loss of balance based on your angular position and velocity at the end of reaction time. Basically, a common threshold is shared between those perturbations. If you end up under this threshold at the end of balance recover, at the end of uh, reaction time, you are likely to recover from it. But cross this threshold and the fall becomes unavoidable. If you give the model a perturbation and the participant, 
Then comparing the points it computes to this threshold, lets us predict the outcome of a loss of balance before it even happens. Let's say that uh, the passerby gives point A on the graph. It is under the line, so he is likely to recover his balance fairly easily. On the other hand, the, pass the passenger B is above the line, which means she will likely fall. I'm sorry for her. What makes our model valid is that modeling errors are smaller than the experimental variability of results. Using this model to thus help predict falls, design safety features, plan experimental protocols, and evaluate training programs without endangering participants. Thank you for your attention. Great job, Despar. Nice job. All right, so we will again fill our two minutes of judging time here. We'll do another trivia question. All right, so muscular hydrostats are often mimicked in soft robotics. So these cool structures are prominent in both elephants and octopuses. Um, but octopi? Uh, octopi, we looked it up. I think it's octopuses. I don't know. I, I didn't get a PhD in grammar, sorry. <laughs> um, but an octopus and an elephant have prominent muscular hydrostats. But the trivia question is how many are in a lemur? Tricky question. Yeah. <clears throat> All it. We'll take a second, maybe venture an answer in the chat. Um, we can talk about what a muscular hydrostat is for the audience members who don't know. So it's a pretty cool muscle thing that, as a fan of muscles that do weird jobs, that's one I enjoy. Um, so a muscular hydrostat in, in an elephant. Can I guess? It, yeah, go for it. Uh, is it one for the tongue? That is a good guess um, because muscular hydrostat is muscles that are doing a job without connecting to bones. So an elephant trunk or an octopus leg. But the really tricky part of this question is you're right, it's in the tongue, but the answer is two because lemurs have two tongues. Oh, they have two tongues? Yeah, isn't that wild? <laughs> Why? What? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Like yeah. two separate tongues that do Yeah, different they're, they're like overlapped. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, isn't that bizarre? That's amazing. I love that question. OK, um, moving on. <laughs> so nobody gets Skittles. Okay, our next speaker is Janelle Kanita from Stanford University. Imagine with every step you take, a throbbing pain radiates from your knee. The person shown here joins over 600 million people worldwide living with this pain due to knee osteoarthritis. This non-reversible disease breaks down knee cartilage and can progress to bone on bone scraping. The only cure is getting a knee replacement, which has a limited lifetime and requires intensive surgery and a long recovery. Fortunately, to delay the need for surgery, researchers have identified ways to change how people walk, such as turning your feet in or out that help alleviate pain similar to medication levels. Let's call these walking modifications. These work by offloading the knee compared to normal walking, which can slow osteoarthritis progression. However, we can't directly measure loading within the knee, so we use computer musculoskeletal models of the human body. This allows us to estimate the unmeasurable knee contact forces between the thigh and shin bone using a simulation method called static optimization, which solves for muscle forces that we can use to calculate the knee contact forces. However, we use many assumptions in simulations and they can only provide estimates. So how can we make sure that these are accurate? Fortunately, some people have knee replacements that can measure knee contact forces when they're moving. We can compare these measurements to our estimates to assess the accuracy of our musculoskeletal modeling and simulation methods. 
Specifically, we're interested in the accuracy of estimating reductions from walking modifications in the two knee contact force peaks observed during stepping. As shown by the plot on the right, when comparing our estimates to data for knee replacements, we found that for peak reductions, 10% of body weight caused by walking modifications compared to baseline walking, static optimization agreed with there being a reduction at the first peak for 70% of the measurements and 78% of the measurements at the second peak. Our accuracy increases as the reductions get bigger. In conclusion, our study shows that a generic simulation pipeline using static optimization is sufficient to detect reductions in knee contact force peaks, which could increase adoption of personalized walking modifications in the clinic. Researchers and clinicians can use simulation to test how much different walking modifications can reduce knee force in a patient-specific manner and confidently choose the best modification to prescribe. Having demonstrated accuracy in a small group of people with knee replacements, we can have confidence in expanding personalized walking modifications evaluated by simulations to people without knee replacements too. By helping bring precision medicine to orthopedics, we can empower those like the person shown here to live with osteoarthritis. Thank you. Thanks, Janelle. Great job. Nice job. All right, for our two minute break here, we'll let our judges do their thing and we'll do another question. So sticking with our animal category, realize this is like an animal and muscles category, um, but I like muscles. So uh, this question is how many muscles does a spider use to fully extend all of its legs? So maybe a tricky math question as we add up the legs of a spider, the number of joints that need to be extended in a spider leg. Give everyone a little time if they want to think about how they might calculate that. All right, so we have a guess of 32. Ooh, a guess of none. a few more seconds for guesses of spiders. Eight. There's an eight. Mm -hmm. All right. Do all spiders have the same number of muscles they use for this? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, this one was actually a super tricky one, but we have one correct answer and it actually is none. It's zero because spider extensor joints use a hydraulic joint mechanism and not a muscular mechanism. So they have muscles to flex their legs, but not to extend them. So mm. I'm justifying my dislike of spiders for their lack of extensor muscles. I think that must be why they're so creepy. That's why they creep me out because uh, mm. like an extensor muscle and their lack of it is in eight cases is bothersome to me. Yeah, I think that's wrong. SLA is for them. <laughs> All right, so I think we're ready for our next speaker. Oh, this one. All right, so next is Ojun Zhang from Northwestern University. Take it away. Hello, everyone. For a neurologic injury, gait rehabilitation is used to help a patient form an appropriate internal model to control consistent aspects of their envi environment and to improve their ability to manage environmental uncertainty like an unexpected perturbation. While it is important for a patient to learn both these skills during gait rehabilitation, it is unclear how external uncertainty impacts locomotor adaptation. This study aims to answer this question. Does exposure to external uncertainty affect locomotor adaptation? 26 healthy young adults were assigned to either a control or perturbation group. Each group performed an identical series of walking trials starting with 20 non-field baseline trials and ending with 70 consistent viscous force field trials. However, there was one exception. The perturbation group performed 30 walking trials during which 
they experience through the random lateral perturbation. These perturbation trials occurred immediately before the viscous force field trials. In addition, we analyzed the first and the last four trials of the viscous force field trials as early field and late field, respectively. Our results of center of mass trajectories demonstrated that both groups of participants showed adaptation to the viscous force field. Their late field center of mass trajectories were closer to their baseline trajectory than during early field trials. However, the center of mass trajectory of perturbation group did not return to their baseline at late field as control group did indicating the adaptation to viscous force field was impeded following exposure to pseudorandom perturbations. In conclusion, prior exposure to pseudorandom perturbations led to limited locomotor adaptation. Our results suggest that clinicians should be especially careful about the introduction of environmental uncertainty in walking rehabilitation training. Thank you for listening. Great job, Hong Zhang. Thank you. All right. So for our last for our two minutes of judging, we'll do one more animal question. Um, so the question is: while in motion, does the pelvic girdle of a rip, average river cooter rotate more on land or in water? And so we for those who don't know, a river cooter is in fact a type of turtle. Mm. Does that help? So is their pelvic girdle rotating more on land or in water as they move through it? So swimming or walking? So we got a couple land answers. Land answers, so more rotation on land. I'm guessing. Yeah, so that's actually correct. Both Keith, Allison, nice job. So it is rotating more on land. Um, yeah, Kate, didn't know turtles had pelvic girdle. Yeah, so this was a super cool study. This is this question was a throwback to an ASB keynote in uh, what year were we in? It was the meeting in Boulder where Beth Brainerd presented some very cool studies using XROM to actually put markers into turtle pelvis and track them while they were moving so she could see through the shell and see how these um, turtle skeletons were moving in locomotion. So very cool stuff, um, measuring both swimming and walking um, and lots of other cool animal bone movement through these methods. Yeah, she's looking at rib cage motion too, right? Rib yeah, cage. she looked at rib cage motion and fish, like all sorts of cool stuff that mm -hmm. you're able to track. But yeah, you'd never think turtles have like all this like pelvic motion happening inside that shell, but they oh. move it more on land. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, oh. Cool. All righty. All right. Um, the next speaker is Shay. Um, from Northwestern University. If we see someone walking, we may notice right away if their gait seems to be asymmetric. This may be a limp or their toes pointing inward or outward. We intuitively know that they are putting additional stress on their body and are working harder to maintain forward movement. For prosthetic users, replicating symmetrical gait is an even greater challenge. This puts prosthesis users at an increased risk for development of secondary health conditions in their non-prosthetic or sound limb. In particular, those with an above knee or transfemoral prosthesis are at an increased risk for de developing musculoskeletal conditions in their sound limb and require greater overall energy to walk. So what can we do to make walking with an above knee prosthesis more like able-bodied walking and easier on the body? We first have to determine where compensations are being made and how much energy is lost with the use of a prosthesis. These compensations are the result of things such as the inability to push off from the ankle or absorb energy with the knee. We analyzed 25 single limb above knee prosthesis users walking on a treadmill at several speeds. 
Dynamic walking is commonly modeled as a double inverted pendulum. So this was the method we used to calculate work on the body center of mass throughout a step. We looked at each limb separately to evaluate the work contributions of each. We secondarily assessed the differences in work between subjects using two different prosthetic knee types, microprocessor and mechanical knees. Microprocessor knees are thought to provide a more sophisticated method of control by implementing motors and electronic components that are supposed to help more closely match that of able-bodied walking. One of the limitations of a prosthesis is the inability to push off with the ankle foot mechanism. We found that the prosthetic limb was producing nearly no power and was essentially an energy sink and just a means to support the body as it transitions into the next step. On the sound limb, work in the middle and end of the step increased as speed increased, which indicated that the sound limb is compensating for the energy lost to the prosthesis. Specifically, the sound limb hip is facing greater demands during walking. With the sound limb being essentially the sole provider of energy, the need to assess the long-term overuse effects to the sound limb is essential. When looking at the two different prosthetic needs used by our subjects, we found that the impact to the sound limb was reduced with the use of a microprocessor knee. We saw that the sound limb is compensating for the loss of energy when walking with an above knee prosthesis, which suggests the need for interventions such as physical therapy techniques or development of new prosthetic technology that focuses on ways to increase prosthetic limb push off. With a refined focus, health risks to the sound limb and above knee prosthesis users can be reduced and the demands of walking can be closer to that of able-bodied walking. Thanks. Great job, Shay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we'll start our two minute break here. Um, do another trivia question. So we had a category all about space, biomechanics of space. Um, and so first question is, where can you find the onboard human accelerometers that will greatly malfunction if you no longer know which way is up? So where on the body do these human accelerometers exist? That get a little wonky when you go into space. I see a couple of ears. That's what I would say too. Years. Oh, get I some mean, specific canal. answers of semicircular canals. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so we have some winners. So, virtual Skittles, Amanda, Allison, they are the ears, specifically the inner ears or the semicircular canals. Allison, you got that. Right, you would find your onboard accelerometer. So you have built in inertial measurement. You, there you go. You can measure your own accelerometer accelerations. Um, this yeah, why do we need all these devices to measure it if we already know? We already it. have ears, right? <laughs> I guess the issue is you don't have ears on each of your limbs. So if right. your arms and legs could hear, maybe you could also tell where you were better. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And I think this one will be our last speaker. Uh, this is going to be Allison Hockey from Montana State University. So let's take it away. How many of you like to run? Now, how many of you don't actually like to run, but do it because it's good for you? Personally, I'm in the second camp here. There's a pretty good chance that you or someone you know participates in running. There's also a pretty good chance that you or one of your running friends has developed a running related overuse injury. In fact, up to three quarters of all runners develop an injury over the course of a year. And for up to half of those individuals, these injuries occur at the knee. With these injury rates, a lot of research has been dedicated to determining potential causes and contributing factors of running injuries. One thing we have investigated is the coordination of your leg segments and joints. In other words, how the various parts of your leg work together to create movements. 
As humans, we have some inherent amount of variability in this coordination. Coordination variability describes how our individual body segments can move in a variety of different ways to create the same overall movement. Let's take the squat, for example. We may use different movement techniques, such as keeping our torso upright or pushing our hips backward, but our overall movement is still a squat. Now you may be thinking, how can coordination variability tell us anything about running injuries? The answer may lie within your knee joint. Specifically, I am talking about the internal loading of your tissue. Repetitive loading of tissue like the patellofemoral joint has previously been associated with running injuries and with minimal amounts of variability, this load may pass through the tissue in the same manner on every step of your run, potentially increasing injury risk. While this link between variability and loading is interesting, it has not yet been assessed in running populations. My work looks to address this very gap in the research. Using various methodologies and calculations, we analyzed variability between the leg, the knee, and the rear foot, as well as several patellofemoral loading metrics in 64 runners. We then utilized statistical analyses to group our knee loading metrics into instantaneous peak joint loading and cumulative joint loading. In other words, loading that happens over time and distance. We found that runners with lower variability also had greater peak loading of their knee, but there was no relationship between variability and cumulative loading. Therefore, these results suggest that the way in which coordination variability is related to the development of running injuries is through peak knee joint loading rather than the loading of the joint over time. While further research is needed to elucidate this hypothesis, our study may aid both researchers and clinicians alike when dealing with running injuries, where coordination variability may potentially help to inform us of risk of injury development or injury recovery. Thank you. Thanks, great job, Allison. All right. We'll let our judges, our last speaker, but for everyone in the audience, we are gonna have a poll um, so that we can select an audience choice favorite. So, uh, seeing, do we have that poll we can put in the chat? Or should I? I can launch it right now thank you one second here all right the poll has been launched all right so please fill out this poll also we have a little bit of time before this session officially ends so if anyone has questions for any of our speakers you're welcome to put them in the chat um, and we can ask them and also after this we are having a spatial chat time. Um, I believe the Borelli room was the assigned one, but remember you can search for people on the side there. Um, so you're welcome to follow up with our speakers in that as well. That's at the, in the spatial chat, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the spatial chat is kind of organized into rooms. Yeah, one I can drop a link in the, uh, in the chat here in just a second once I get it up to the spatial chat room. And then you said that the keynote starts at two, right? It does indeed, yes. Yeah. So people yeah. have a little time to chat spatially. Yeah, there's a bit of time to breathe. Yeah. Uh, so wow. I, have, I have on my notes here, the spatial chat discussion room is S2 Mary. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I thought I saw S1 Borelli, but that I don't I know that, if that's the latest. So that could be the uh, there were probably maybe that got copied from the doctoral one. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it might be that looks like that's where the doctoral one is. Mm. So just... All right. so we'll leave our poll open a few more minutes. So if you have not taken a chance to vote, please do that. But Let's thank our speakers. Um, yeah. They've done a fantastic job, a lot of very cool research and well done combining it into a few short minutes. These were great presentations yeah. and really fun to watch. So congrats to everyone. Yeah, congratulations, you guys. They were all fantastic. Yeah. Smarties for everyone, lots of Smarties. <laughs> Yes. 
And uh, the the winners of the competition will be announced at the business meeting, right? Tomorrow? At the ASB business okay. meeting, which is tomorrow. Tomorrow. At, yeah, I think it's noon Pacific time, three right. Eastern time, <laughs> spanning several time zones at the moment. Be sure to show up for that. All right, well, if there's no further questions, I think maybe we can end our session here, but direct everyone to spatial chat for some discussion and socializing. And thank you all for joining us. Congrats, speakers. Bye, great job, everybody. Uh, are we right. supposed to take the results from the audience poll? <laughs>